Hello everyone, welcome to the 12th lecture of this massive open online course on sociology of development. As you know, we are in the fifth week of this course. We are discussing modernization theory, I mean as a part of, as part 2 through the works of Theodore Sanin. What we have discussed in the last class, uh, starting with Sanin, if you slightly recall, we have discussed how modernization theory postulates that the less developed economies would eventually catch up with industrialized world provided they emulate the social and economic pattern of western capitalism. And that is how it has been colonialist in nature, it has been uh, imperialistic in nature and so on. It has been racist in nature. And what we have discussed in the last class that the radical upsurge of 1968 and its aftermath were linked to and followed by a renewed debate between the socialists about the nature of revolutions and tactics and strategies of revolutionary struggles. There we have discussed uh, the Vietnam War during and after 1968, uh, Chicago referring to the 1968 democratic revolution uh, where police beat demonstrators as they chanted the whole world is watching. San Francisco state where a 1968 69 strike led by students of color made the first major breakthrough in the fight for ethnic studies. We have also discussed Cambodia and Kent state referring to Richard Nixon's ill-fated 1970 invasion of Cambodia and the shooting of four white students by the Ohio National Guard and uh, the role of uh, Latin American revolutionaries Che Guevara. We have also discussed how a search for the agencies of revolutionary change and an analysis of the impediments for the crux of, of a threefold debate and the prospects of social revolution and the search for the revolutionary class of our time have provided the first focus. Uh, I mean these, uh, I mean those sneeringly referred to by their adversaries as third worldists opposed proletarianists to coin an equally ugly term. A second argument cross cut the first concentrating on revolutionary organizations and their relation to the classes or masses. The issue of a vanguard uh, revolutionary party of a uh, guerrilla uh, foco and so on. And the third problem the last to be confronted but not the least in importance has been uh, that of the state and revolution I mean or more specifically of the nature of the state in societies where revolutions have been contained uh, of the states which revolutionaries challenge and of the state within which a revolution becomes institutionalized. The political context that triggered off and fed the debate is not far to seek. Uh, the 1968 Vietnam, France, United States, China and Czechoslovakia. The uh, death of uh, both Che Guevara and Allende in the Latin American uh, backyard of the United States. The many stabilizations that followed. And the increasing melee of those craving rapid change yet faced with the strength and violence of the world's many establishments, crimes and casualties perpetrated by the so-called within court establishments, inadequacies of theoretical thought, uh, uh, left and right alike, I mean no less significant for the argument where the dramatic lessons in the inadequacies of theoretical uh, thought left and right alike. The 1968 wave of radicalism, the split between the People's Republic of China on the one hand and the erstwhile uh, Soviet Union on the other. Uh, 
the depth of the economic crisis in the West, the cultural revolution of, uh, in the People's Republic of China, the impact of the organization of petroleum exporting countries, Cambodia, uh, uh, Khomeini uh, or the Ogaden, none of which had been predicted or even adequately explained exposed factor. New events, uh, what we have discussed, new events within an increasingly global scene have challenged, exploded and transformed the tr structures of our understanding and the boundaries of intuitive plausibility. The exceptional significance of evidence drawn from the so-called developing societies for the reconsideration and, and redefinition of contemporary social sciences is consequent upon it. Tensions between reality and social theory have been most explicit and the challenge to deduction more illuminating and profound precisely in those societies. And then we have discussed the reconsideration of established concepts in the light of the new often non-European developments lies at the core of the post-1968 debate. The discussion of the early 1970s about revolutionary classes and revolutionary perspectives was both an example of it and an important case in itself. The argument unfolded within the basic framework of the Marxist tradition that, that implied a common commitment to uh, change aimed at abolishing the social base of uh, exploitation and domination of human by human. That is why I, I try to give you this example. I mean, I try to quote uh, William Wordsworth from lines written in early spring in 1798, have I not risen to lament what man has made of man? Okay? I mean, the joy that man perceives in the natural world and his belief that his own soul is somehow intimately connected to that joy leads Wordsworth to mourn what man has made of man. In other words, the cruelty, selfishness and fighting that characterize humanity. While humans are very much are essentially a part of nature, they certainly do not act that way. Okay? We stopped here in the last class. In, in today's lecture, what we are going to do? We are going to look at such reconsideration of established concepts in the light of the new, often non-European developments that lies at the core of the post-1968 debate and such discussion of the early 1970s about revolutionary classes and revolutionary perspectives which unfolded within the, the basic framework of the Marxist tradition that implied a common commitment to change aimed at abolishing the social base of exploitation and, and domination of human by human, it accepted sociological perspective whose major components are the determining impact of political economy and of class conflict within social structure. It also accepted revolutionary violence as the probable and indeed usual, though not obligatory, way of bringing about the necessary social changes. And at this point, nevertheless, paths began to diverge. That's why I, I, I have been mentioning the nature of uh, revolutions, the revolutionary tactics, the revolutionary strategies and so on. When I say revolutionary strategies and revolutionary tactics, I mean the third world I mean, um, one group of analysts look to the third world as the area where revolutionary conditions are ripe and where revolutions which might develop into socialist ones are in the cards. The industrial working class might develop, uh, I mean, the industrial working class of the advanced capitalist societies, on the contrary, is increasingly diversified in numbers uh, and sunk in a complacency derived in part from the benefits of the imperial spoils. The main weight of global capitalist exploitation fall, fell most heavily upon the developing societies, 
in particular on the peasants and the urban poor of peasant background who together formed the major oppressed classes in the developing economies. The established working class in less developed countries has been privileged in relation to the peasant majority, the poorest urbanites and the unemployed. It is also relatively, uh, I mean the established working, uh, industrial working class is also relatively small in numbers and will remain so until the imperialist controls that result in underdevelopment are broken. Therefore, the masses in the exploited dependencies, I mean less developed economies, the un underprivileged classes, I mean the peasants, the urban poor, the workers plus perhaps the intelligentsia constitute a force in the global capitalist system which is revolutionary in the sense Marx considered the proletariat of the early period of modern industrialization to be revolutionary. And against, against this, others stuck to the more Marxist, more orthodox Marxist guns. What is this? Now, the most advanced technology, the centers of power and knowledge lie in the industrialized societies and it is therefore from that socialism has to be established around the globe that socialism will be born uh, from the womb of capitalism. It is the social character of the industrial working class, its unity on the soft floor, uh, its skills acquired in dealing with advanced uh, technology, its size, its propertylessness, its explicit relations of conflict with the capitalists which make it into the most revolutionary, indeed the only revolutionary and socialist class of our times. A closer look at, at uh, a closer look indicates that some of the very premises of the comparison uh, of that comparison were spurious. The presence of the proletarianists argument uh, often seem realistic enough, their images backed by political experience and study. It is the image of the proletariat that has remarkably little to do with the actual life of the contemporary working class in industrialized capitalist societies. Indeed, the more one tries to match the real working class with its hypothetical model, the more the model looks either prehistoric that is irrelevant to our times or ahistoric that is utopian, then it becomes insignificant. It is this hypothetical proletariat and that outstrips real peasants in its revolutionary and socialist potential. Okay. Let us try to turn this comparison in incomparables into such comparison between the empirical peasantry and the hypothetical proletariat. Such comparison of incomparables into comparative analysis of real social classes in a real world. Sometime back, uh, N. Harris published as part of the third worldist proletarianist debate that provides a list of characteristics of the peasantry or rather of its political shortcomings as compared to the proletariat of an industrial metropolis, more advanced country. Let us go, go through the list first, okay? uh, what Harris has to say, uh, comparing the political characteristics of empirical peasants with those of empirical industrial workers rather than uh, attempting to deduce them from a historic or philosophical theory whose supreme value in Marx's words consists of being supra-historical. Okay? Let us now see, supra-historical, I mean it which goes beyond history, ahistorical, utopian, okay? prehistoric or, or rather uh, which, which does not uh, have relevance to our times. Okay? Then what are these? One, peasants in their political struggles tend to fight for land rather than for broader political aims to be preoccupied with local day-to-day -day concerns rather than with general long-term aims and complex ideologies. That no doubt is true, but so do industrial workers. 
wages, pensions and holidays simply take the place of land, rent and taxes. The name for this limitation of origins in the revolutionary lexicon is bread and butter issues, unionism or economism. Only at long intervals and under conditions of extraordinary crisis have the workers directly attacked the uh, system of property relations by seizing the means of production, whatever the explanation and immediate impulse in Russia in 1917-18. I mean, during the October Revolution. In Northern Italy in 1919, in Shanghai in 1927, so did Mexican peasants under Japata, Russian peasants in 1905-06, and again in 1917-1919, and Chinese peasants in 1926. Both peasants and proletarians in these confrontations dominated the political scene for a short while, where eventually come down by reforms and or by brutal suppression by the state and finally lost impetus and impact with different social forces took over. As, as a corollary, you will find the workers develop a nationwide class consciousness and class organization consequently a class for itself while the peasants remain disunited and politically naive at times okay this this class for itself i mean there is a transition from class in itself to class for itself what is this transition i mean class in itself means when you will find uneducated unconscious, subconscious workforce who are less organized, they are unorganized workforce and class for itself means those who are intellectually and politically conscious, they are more organized, they are politically literate. Okay? And this transition that perhaps, perhaps only the industrial working class has been able to make in, in a few countries, whereas the Peasants remain disunited and politically naive. This is the argument that Harris uses the example of Russian peasants while fighting landlords worship the, the jar. Okay? I mean, they only fought, we fought against uh, the landlords, feudal lords, but not against the jar, not against the state. Okay? Then, then perhaps, perhaps. They, uh, those, those peasants in Russia, they, they, they stayed with or they remained at the level of class in itself. They could not make a transition to class for itself. Okay? That is why Harris uses the example of the Russian peasants who while fighting landlords worshipped the jar. The, the claim that there are important differences between workers and peasants holds true for the reasons indicated that is the, the, the that is that working in a large industrial uh, working in large industrial structures facilitates organization and self organization not surprisingly therefore workers have often shown uh, superiority over uh, uh, superiority over peasants uh, in organizing nationwide associations and adopting nationwide symbols. But the relationship is nothing uh, but one to none. The political and revolutionary potential of the workers is by no means constant. Um, maybe, maybe we will we'll see when we will be, we'll be dealing with, with especially this one. Uh, the, the peasants do not control their leaders. They are the object and tool rather than the subject of political action. We'll, we'll deal with this. But, but on, on the contrary, what the green movements of the peasantry in Eastern Europe during the First World War and the Second World War provide ample proof that peasants have the capacity to consolidate as a class and to create their own organizations through which to fight for political power. Poland, for example, to give a specific instance, has seen powerful peasant parties 
a real peasant prime minister uh, and, and even in the 1930s a nationwide and reasonably successful peasant general strike. The differences are therefore uh, mainly ones of, of uh, degree and context and incidentally the bulk of Russian workers uh, worshipped the jar in 1904 as much as did peasants as bloody Sunday in, in January 1905 clearly proved. Only by 1917 had, uh, had the bulk of the Russian working class finally said is this faith, but by that time uh, so had a crucial uh, part of the peasants. The peasants do not control their leaders, uh, they are the object and tool rather than the subject of political action. That has been true once again for peasants and workers alike. The, this, um, I mean, Harris, what he did, he pointed that, he pointed to the fact that uh, the Communist Party of China was not an agent of uh, the Chinese peasant class and that its leadership was drawn mainly from the urban intelligentsia. One could add that it, it was mainly of rural origin and that it directed and utilized the rank and file at times against the immediate interests of peasants. No doubt this was substantially so. The same seems to apply to the relations between the Bolsheviks and the Russian workers. Uh, Lenin's writings, I mean I am referring to what is to be done and in particular the type of organization he built made this clear and legitimized it within the socialist movement as one of the necessities of revolutionary action. Time has not made that debate obsolete. The essentials of the proletarianist view have been repeated with, with a few modifications. Some of the recent writings deconceptualized peasants altogether, labeling them the rural development of the petty bourgeois or, or rather rural detachment of, of the rural, uh, petty bourgeois. What is at issue is not simply the social and political characteristics of peasants within different areas and conditions. Indeed, a similar conceptual denigration could be documented for other social classes and groups in contemporary societies. The image of the peasant is clearly used as an anti-model, an abstraction and a punching bag in order to elevate the hypothetical proletariat and to justify its monopoly over the revolutionary organizations uh, or, or revolutionary imagination. There are reasons why this type of reification, reification if you, if you slightly recall that we have discussed earlier, a reification refers to the process where the result of our actions appears to us as a quasi natural thing or matter or object because we do not recognize its social origins or process of creation that, has, that goes into its formation. That is what we have discussed. That is why I said there are reasons why this type of um, reification which depends on false comparisons has persisted within Marxist orthodoxy. Wasteful thinking is as always one reason a ways to see change in the world we ourselves live in. Uh, since it is industrial workers who form the massive lower class in the societies to which western intellectuals belong. Taken to extremes, this turns into the fallacy of dismissing deductively and automatically as unscientific any evidence or analysis not reducible to the simple proletarians or revolutionary proposition. Secondly, some of these images of peasants result from faithfully following Marx's views of uh, over a century ago or a couple of centuries ago. Uh, Marx um, lived in a world in which peasants had formed the majority for millennia, while the industrial working class was only in its, uh, in, uh, in its infant stage. Now, something new, promising and exciting during the uh, I mean, in the 20th century, there was a particularly uh, rapid transformation of urban industrial 
society in the centers of world capitalism hence whereas the majority of students of developing societies can still recognize contemporary peasants from the picture drawn by marx in the 18th brumaire and his comments there seem still remarkably fresh and useful a contemporary industrial worker in detroit or or uh, coventry is nearly unrecognizable in terms of 19th century descriptions of workers whether they be marx both jola or or dickens marx was after all a better theoretician than a prophet an epi uh, an epithop uh, of which should no doubt please him greatly uh, finally peasants and intellectuals do not fit well into global theoretical structures of elegant simplicity those who prefer pure deduction to social investigation do not like them the the manifest disparity between proletarianist images and actual reality does not mean that peasantism is the correct alternative quite the contrary uh, recent history has brought into question any belief in a single natural and sole revolutionary class revolutions have happened they will no doubt happen again and provide abundant evidence of class determined political action but the same evidence also demonstrate that uh, demonstrates that different classes can be revolutionary and that is the revolutionary potential of the same class may vary greatly in different social and historical contexts political contexts economic contexts cultural contexts that is why one cannot simply deduce revolutionary potential from a general definition the central question is what are the general conditions under which successful revolutions from below occur in in other words what must we concentrate on in making such an analysis what are the component elements and what are the relationships and contradictions between these components in a general model of revolution in which class analysis in a narrow sense constitutes a major and necessary input but is insufficient on its own during the 1968 wave of revolutionary optimism the discussion of revolution tended naturally to focus on the revolutionary army that is on those who are or may become revolutionary it usually underestimated the intrinsic power of of the systems of social domination to mobilize resources to manipulate and to readjust those capacities are not only immense but still growing and a more realistic way of putting the question is how do revolutions take place and succeed at all rather than why do revolutions not take place more frequently okay that's why more importantly we must pose this question how do revolutions take place and succeed at all not the question that why do oh, why don't revolutions take place very often okay that's why it's the central question is what are the general conditions under which su- successful revolutions from below occur putting it succinctly what must we concentrate on in making such an analysis what are the component elements and what are the relationships and contradictions between these components in a general model of revolution in which class analysis in a narrow sense constitutes a major and necessary input but is insufficient on its own that's why uh, uh, the the question still uh, remains very valid and relevant today that how do revolutions take place and and succeed at all lenin for example who was well versed in practice theory and at art of revolution reminded us that there are two sides of the, there are two sides to the equation in his remark that revolutions occur when neither the ruled nor the rulers are able to go on living in the old way that is true but it needs further specification if we define successful revolution as a as a leap that is uh, quanta transformation okay quantum jump okay involving um, massive popular intervention in social structure property relations 
systems of domination, class divisions as well as in typical forms of cognition, the transformation of the state and the removal of its rulers, then the processes that preceded and led to revolution have in the 20th century universally displayed four major characteristics. One, a major crisis causing severe dislocation of society and its day to day functioning, a major crisis to a major crisis of the governing elite affecting its ability to govern, three, a crystallization of classes and subclasses expressed in a sharp increase in self identification, organization and militancy among along class lines and four, an effective revolutionary organization providing leadership in the political struggle. A heuristic model would have to recognize that while each of these elements is, is partly determined by the other three, each must also be analyzed on its own terms that is its own specific characteristics and dynamics. I mean all these four starting with a major crisis um, causing severe dislocation of society and its day to day functioning to a major crisis of the governing elite uh, affecting its ability to govern, three uh, a crystallization of classes and subclasses expressed in a sharp increase in self identification, organization and militancy along class lines and four an effective or revolutionary organization providing leadership in the political struggle. Revolutions furthermore are always embedded in an international context, both national as well as international contexts, relevant uh, and often decisive for their outcome. In the most politically direct and analytically trivial sense, foreign intervention can preclude revolution or defeat it. It can also promote it and accelerate it. More significantly, if contradictory is the long term impact of the world economy and polity reflected in the fact that all the internally generated and successful revolutions of our of, of the 20th century uh, have occurred in the type of societies we call developing that is societies at the underprivileged pole in a world capitalist system of inequalities with consequences for important features of their internal structures and it indicates a particular kind of state, a particular kind of class system and a particular kind of revolution. That is why perhaps, perhaps revolutions are not universal phenomena, they have to be located in, in specific social historical context. The epiphenomenal uh, state and the substitute bourgeois that, that we just have, we just discussed the four prong and model four major characteristics that a major crisis causing severe dislocation of society and its day to day functioning to a major crisis of the governing elite affecting its ability to govern, three a crystallization of um, classes and subclasses expressed in a sharp increase in self identification, organization and militancy along class lines and four an effective revolutionary organization providing leadership in the political struggle. To return to the four prong model like this, the build up to a, a revolutionary situation entails societal crisis that stops or impedes the functioning of structures of domination as well as day to day social life. A uh, situation in which in Mandel's uh, expression society fails to deliver the goods. A major economic collapse or a military defeat are the principal obvious cases. The, the importance of functional uh, breakdown to the coercive and manipulative responses that are effective in a social system that operates as usual. Only circumstances of, of the most extreme kind will induce masses of people to engage in a uh, head on class with the powers that be and to endangering safety, uh, livelihood and lives. Second, 
revolutionary situations and prospects reflect the nature and dynamics of the rulers and in particular the conditions under which the governing elite loses its grip. This deterioration of the ability to govern does not come about simply as a result of an increase in the pressure of, uh, uh, pressure of revolutionary forces and or a general social crisis, but has its own partly autonomous logic. The weakness or decline of the dominant class and or of its direct links with uh, the governing elite are contributory. But once again, a crisis of governing cannot be reduced to a, a crisis of class hegemony. The issue of state and revolution uh, relates to major conceptual clusters. The contemporary state is the principal machinery of social domination and ordering which links territorially uh, delimited and, and hierarchically organized social structures with the social groups which govern them. Lehman and, and his colleagues share the assumption of the state's exceptional significance as the major unit of institutionalized and monopolized power, day-to-day -day administrative and enforcement procedures, economic action, uh, identification, political mobilization, legitimation and social reproduction in its broader, broadest sense. A revolution is necessarily a war against the state. The basic question of every revolution is that of state power. A successful revolution is first of all a victory over the state and its transformation. At the core of Marxist tradition lies a challenge to the liberal belief in the parliamentary state as a simple tool for managing society, serving everybody's interest evenly within the framework of a social contract between rational equals and or as a neutral computer like mediator of class interests. The principal alternative view uh, offered by Marx and Engels was to approach the state as a, as a tool of class domination, an executive committee of the ruling class and in their work and that of their successor notably Kotsky and Lenin, the very existence of, of the state was seen as the product of the, of the irre irreconcilable uh, nature of conflict in class society and was therefore limited to class societies. Cases in which those who made policy and managed society did not directly express the will of the dominant class or even challenge it such as under absolutism um, uh, were, were ex explained by the transitional balance of class forces that made for the relative autonomy of the state administration, enabling it to play a balancing role. This autonomy was always restricted in the long run by the interests of the dominant classes, an attempt by Bukharin to ask, the, ask what the new phenomenon of an uh, increasingly interventionist state might mean for the Marxist theory of the state was rapidly forgotten. Only recently have new conceptualizations of the state, emphasizing its relative autonomy, been developed in the work of Marxist analysts, these come increasingly uh, to stress the in institutional materiality of the state, its role in organizing the power block of class forces and its economic functions. To the Marxist tradition, the post-colonial state okay, has, has offered therefore a significant analytical challenge. These states seem to have been uh, parachuted by colonial rule and then taken over lock, stock and barrel that is in their territorial claims, administration and legal structures by independence movements. The, a, a dominant class in, in the classical capitalist sense of control over the means of production clearly distinct from the management of the state often did not seem to exist to any significant extent. Look at the, uh, the case of Tanzania for example. 
The first serious Marxist conceptualization of the special characteristics of such states was offered by the term overdeveloped states. Overdeveloped, what I mean here that is with respect to its uh, imported characteristics and as against the relative underdevelopment of its indigenous class structures. In that view, while a state's origins might be colonial, its actual power base and its relative autonomy rested on a new class balance between the metropolitan bourgeois, which retained its influence, the local bourgeois and, and the local landlords, who together constituted the, the dominant class coalition. A much uh, cruder one dimensional version uh, was also offered in which the power base of such a state was seen simply to be reflected uh, power and interest of neocolonialism. The state within developing societies was merely the local executor of the multinationals and of metropolitan rule, a foreign police force speaking the native tongue. There is no doubt that, uh, about the major importance of the insights of Marxist uh, analysis, classical as well as new, referred to the, the functioning of the state as a repressive power in the service of the propertied classes, its role in developing societies as a local partner of the multinationals, and the way confrontations and balances of class forces structure and underlie the organization of state power. Nevertheless, this is an incomplete model and the experience of developing societies offers a significant reason why this should be so. In most Marxist analysis, the state is treated as epiphenomenal, uh, a reflection of underlying class forces. When I say underlying class forces, I mean both local as well as foreign or the setting for their uh, interplay a conceptual equivalent of the class neutral state of pluralist theories of society, which acts as a management computer. Alternatively, the state is seen as an expression of the structural needs of capital accumulation only. The determinative capacity of the state to shape and reshape society is dismissed or uh, passed over in silence. Uh, via the conceptual reduction of the state to its uh, assumed class dimensions uh, and or the functional needs of capital and or the impact of uh, imperialism and or the, the inertia of the past class uh, and, and colonial rule. Within the pluralist paradigm, a similar reduction of the state to a vector of influences, factors, needs and rational arguments takes place. Even the very possibility of considering the, the opposition between the state and dominant classes is at times removed altogether by an image of a state fully tailored to class needs. There are, there are three fundamental deficiencies in such a, uh, a line of thought. First, while states can be uh, shown to be shaped, produced and determined by class interests and action, they have also produced uh, class structures, transformed them and made them disappear. As, as when a bourgeois or a peasantry has been created by deliberate state policy as in Kenya, uh, Pakistan, Tanzania or Brazil or elsewhere, nor has this happened only in states of the capitalist era, the in, in, um, in the China of Qin Si, uh, 3rd century BC to cite one example, a state initiated agrarian reform effectively abolished the rural proletariat come serf classes that the polarization and debts, debt enslavement of the peasantry had created returning China to square one that is to a gigantic system of smallholder agriculture serving the imperial interest or revolution from above in clear contradiction to the immediate interests of the dominant class of, of the large landowners. Both of the possible routes of determination must thus be considered. Secondly, uh, the state is treated 
as if it operated outside the context of political economy a laissez faire utopia that still colors economics uh, as a discipline. A mode of analysis that focuses on, uh, on political economy and defines it as social production and reproduction making use of human labor through the control of the means of production to produce surplus value applies also to the contemporary state. The state operates within the economy in two ways. It works indirectly through taxation, monopolies, monetary policies, the national debt, employment, uh, patterns of spending and welfare services, a point increasingly incorporated in the theoretical fold. In all those ways, the policy making process structures economic life and redistributes surpluses while uh, which service uh, social functioning, the reproduction of social relations which uh, and, and also social control as well as uh, passing the on costs to the tax uh, to the genuine taxpayers without which the whole contemporary process of capitalist profit making would not work. But the state does not, uh, but the state does not merely offer infrastructure to support or simply reproduce the necessary conditions for capitalism to flourish, uh, it, but it also simultaneously operates as a major capitalist enterprise or holding company in the direct sense of creating surplus value, cooperating and at times competing with national and multinational capital aiming at the control of labor, the maximization of profits and the securing of their privileged use for its personal that is for a specific social group, a uh, state bourgeois according to some, a technocracy to others and uh, I mean uh, entrepreneurial bureaucracy uh, to yet others. Whatever term is used whether it is you may say uh, state bourgeois technocracy or entrepreneurial bureaucracy. Um, the content, the content indicates that a social category with specific corporate interests, a position within the process of production, control of surpluses and strategies of its own. The state and its managers are a, are a politico-economic force in terms of resources, production, power, surpluses and personnel quite apart from the extra economic power which they wield. In developing societies, the scope of state economy broadens so that typical examples of it would include not only state-owned factories and mines, but also state monopolies such as the state boards controlling main export crops such as coffee in Ghana or cotton in, the, in Sudan, uh, which are bought and extracted cheaply from their producers to be sold dearly on international markets. With the, remain, uh, with the remainder siphoned off uh, for the maintenance of the privileged state apparatus. Such monopolies and an important exploitative dimension, a gigantic dispersed manufacture in Marx's sense, the socio-economic equivalent of an early bourgeois exploiting a smallholder economy. The wage in which any actually existing capitalism in a developing society is run depend upon the class struggle of exploited and exploiters on the structural imperatives of capitalist uh, profit making and also on the confrontation and compromise within a triple alliance of local property owners, multinational companies uh, and those who control the state economy in its indirect and direct sense. Thirdly, the state and the state apparatus are at times uh, treated as two separate phenomena, an analytical distinction elevated into an assumed social reality. That is, the state is depicted as an abstraction of us all served by civil servants while state apparatus simply serves its extract, uh, extra state masters who are the only determinant of the political scene. The direct manifestation of the state is the state apparatus and analytical divisions apart, the one without the other belongs to where, where disembodied spirits do. 
Marx's description adopted by Lenin of the organs of the state provides a good initial list of the bureaucratic core organizations, but also reflects that descriptions, uh, historicity uh, and, and initial limitations. It is it, it also included standing army, police, bureaucracy, clergy and judiciary. The necessary additions today would include the administrators of the economy, welfare, education, the mass media and possibly the ruling party. The last four uh, are, are um, arguably exchangeable for the clergy of Marx's design. The first is notably absent in his list. The, the, the sum total of the organs is, is a system of controls, legitimation uh, and privileges, but also of human beings organized, selected and reproduced according to partly autonomous rules. To a great extent, the social reality and materiality of the state lie here. Uh, furthermore, the bureaucratic system of hierarchical supervision and, and promotion means uh, the concentration of power in the hands of a relatively uh, small group with its specific characteristics, um, internal life, the potential for interchange between its different sectors, ideological patterns and consciously established strategies, a governing elite in direct control of the state apparatus. The term elite has often been challenged especially by Marxists. And, and is often treated as an eclectic admixture that threatens verbal orthodoxies. It has some considerable limitations which must be kept in mind, but it is also the, but it is still the, the only term for which uh, no substitute as yet exists, uh, no uh, one which denotes a real enough social phenomenon that is the characteristics of a small internal linked group at the top of major bureaucratic structures and welding power through them. And attempts to analyze developing societies have produced another image, one as unrealistic as the notion of the state is epiphenomenal. It is the image of the state's total independence of and supremacy over um, the rest of the social matrix, the faith in the manipulative omnipotence of the state typical of many modernizers of the 1950s and 1960s, international experience has since eroded much of the confidence that easy and quick solutions will result once the correct plan or advice has been adopted and its twin belief that the failure of a strategy is simply the result of mistakes or treason. A revolution begins with an attack on the state or state apparatus. The very revolutionary situation is a consequence of the state's failure to contain revolutionaries, to manipulate or suppress opposition, to run its administration and economy. With a few exceptions, it also means the collapse of unified strategy and often of, of nerve at the top. What also seems to be necessary is the establishment of alternative political uh, uh, focuses of authority of, uh, to those of, uh, of the state. And that is why a counterpiece of a revolutionary situation is, is the fragmentation of the governing process which challenges the state's monopoly of it uh, in what Trotsky called dual power and, and Charles Tilly refers to a situation of multiple sovereignties, a political and ideological base outside the the, the spheres of domination and, um, and, and control by the organs of the state. Okay? The nature of so-called developing societies has accentuated some of the general aspects of state organization. The significance of the state economy and of the state bureaucracy are made more obvious by the weakness of the native virtue and or the low classness of of the other social classes. The state is often the main employer and the main source of economic enterprise in what is at times referred to as state capitalism. A capitalist economy run by non-capitalists. 
it may mean a process of eventual transformation of state bureaucrats into capitalists. It is never only that the oppressive nature of state intervention through revolutions from above is particularly salient in developing societies. So are the exceptionally high levels of exploitation and social polarization. The special political characteristics, I mean the military regime's uh, brutality of oppression and its instability are not an aberration but reflect the specific nature of the state in developing societies. The less secure its control, the more visible the oppressive nature of the state. The social structure of developing societies, their characteristically uneven development, uh, the disarticulation between aspects of social and economic structures, the relatively weak domination of the ruled by the rulers, with the ruled excluded from political life rather than politically uh, incorporated, and the immense concentration of control at the top lead to rapid and erratic changes within the political elite. I mean the plots, coups, the thought, uh, assassinations and so on. The relative weakness of the state's grip offers opportunities when a uh, revolutionary organization, weak as it may be, faces a political elite, a state a dom and a dominant class that prove even weaker. The politics of global dependency, the class nature of developing societies and the character of the state in these societies explain why every successful self-generated revolution for over a century has taken place in a developing society. Okay? Now, now if, you, if you look at this, what we have discussed today, we have, we have discussed uh, how uh, there is an acceptance of a sociological perspective whose major components are the determining impact of political economy and of class conflict within social structure. It also accepted a revolutionary violence as the probable and indeed usual, uh, though not obligatory, uh, way of bringing about the necessary social changes. And at this point, however, paths began to diverge um, in terms of revolutionary strategies and revolutionary tactics. And then we have uh, discussed uh, the political characteristics of empirical peasants with those of empirical industrial workers. Uh, then we have discussed uh, peasants in their political struggles tend to fight for uh, land uh, rather than for broader political aims to be preoccupied with local day-to-day -day concerns uh, rather than with general long-term aims and complex ideologies. Then we have discussed how the workers develop a nationwide class consciousness. I mean industrial working class, they tend to develop nationwide class consciousness and class organization, consequently a class for itself. I mean, they make a transition from class in itself to class for itself, while the peasants remain disunited and politically naive. Then we have discussed how the peasants do not control their leaders, they, they become uh, the object and tool rather than the subject of political action. In the next class, what we are going to do, we are going to make further uh, elaboration on, on uh, Sanin's class and classness, um, uh, permanent vanguard and, and revolutionary class, substitutes and realities and so on. Thank you. Mm -hmm.